Hello, my name is Tim Harrison. I'm one of the staff at the School of Chemistry at the University of Bristol. This is a recorded version of the lecture, A Pollutant's Tale. This lecture concerns the gases in the Earth's atmosphere and the consequences of some of the pollutants found there. Before we look at the Earth in detail, let's just consider the other planets in the solar system. On the slide there, you'll see seven planets. Mercury is missing. Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere. Mercury as a planet is so small, it's roughly the same size as the Moon. It doesn't have sufficient gravitational attraction to have kept hold of any of the gases that would have been formed around it when it came into being. The top four gases there are the gas giants. They're predominantly made up of hydrogen, helium and methane. They are chemically similar. They're not chemically identical as there are different amounts of each gas in their atmosphere. Their atmospheres, of course, are also different in thickness. If we look at the terrestrial planets, the ones that you can physically stand on should you get there, Venus and Mars are sister planets, the ones closest to the Sun being Venus, the one further away, Mars, are mainly carbon dioxide and nitrogen. It makes a difference in third place whether it's uh, sulfur dioxide or the gas argon, AR, that's present. And it's fairly obvious that the Earth sticks out like a sore thumb. The Earth is roughly four-fifths nitrogen and one-fifth oxygen. If there was a fourth column there, we'd see carbon dioxide present in the Earth's atmosphere. Carbon dioxide currently is running at 408 parts per million, or 0.0408%. Nitrogen gas N2 is the biggest component of our atmosphere. It makes up 78% of the air that we breathe. The nitrogen molecule has a nitrogen-nitrogen triple covalent bond between the atoms the bond energy, the energy that's required to break apart that nitrogen molecule, is very high, which is the reason why the nitrogen gas doesn't react with the oxygen it's mixed with. That is, unless there's a lightning strike where there's sufficient energy, or perhaps inside the internal combustion engine of a car where there's both enough energy in terms of heat and pressure to turn the gases into nitrogen oxides, NOx gases. At room temperature, nitrogen is a gas, but it can become a liquid if cooled down to minus 196 degrees centigrade. Minus 196 degrees C is roughly 220 degrees colder than the air in the room, and is much colder than any temperature that naturally occurs on planet Earth. The second biggest component in the air that we breathe is the oxygen molecule, O2. Here we have two oxygen atoms linked together by a double covalent bond. The energy required to break that apart is a lot lower than that of nitrogen, and this accounts for the reactivity of oxygen. At room temperature, oxygen is a gas, but if cooled to minus 183 degrees centigrade, it will condense into a pale blue liquid that has some magnetic properties. The reason there is oxygen within planet Earth is due to the chemical reaction called photosynthesis. Plants taking carbon dioxide and water vapour and using the energy from the sun via a complex series of chemical reactions taking place in the chlorophyll, in the chloroplast within the plant cells. Energy is used to produce sugar and oxygen. This is an endothermic chemical reaction as energy is being taken in and that energy ends up being stored in the simple sugars. In the case of the equation in the uh, slide in front of you. The sugar is glucose C6H12O6. This image is a computer generated impression of what hemoglobin would look like. Hemoglobin is the molecule in our red blood cells that carries the oxygen around our system. It's been produced by Adrian Mulholland, who's entitled this piece of artwork, Life Spring. Let's examine the Earth's atmosphere in more detail. The graph in front of you shows you how the temperature of the air changes with altitude. Down on the x-axis, we have the temperature scale. On the y-axis, the altitude going from sea level towards space.
the line represents how the temperature changes with altitude. And it's not a simple case. One might imagine that if you were standing on planet Earth and then went up to space, it would simply get colder as the higher you go, the colder it gets. That isn't the case. It is the case in the lower part of the atmosphere. If we actually take an aircraft and get up to the cruising altitude of between 10 and 12 kilometers, the higher you go, the colder it gets. Military planes, by the way, fly at a much higher height. Above 20 kilometers, above the troposphere, the lowest part of the Earth's atmosphere, strange stuff happens. The higher you go, the warmer it gets. There's a temperature rise at about 25 kilometers from about minus 60 degrees towards zero. And that's a 60 degrees centigrade temperature rise. A lot of heat energy is being produced to warm that part of the atmosphere. And this is due to ozone. In the middle part of the Earth's atmosphere, the stratosphere, the O3 molecule exists. And it exists there because of differences in pressure. Oxygen that we breathe in is O2. At those temperatures, some of the oxygen can become the O3 molecule. Ozone, O3, takes in some of the harmful energy, the harmful UV radiation from the sun, and brings about a series of reactions whose net product is giving out energy and that warms the atmosphere. The higher you go, the less ozone there is, the less of this reaction can happen, so the temperature of the atmosphere cools off. And when we get into the mesosphere, the temperature drops again from about zero to roughly minus 70 degrees centigrade. There is a bit of warming at the top end of the Earth's atmosphere as the Earth is flying through space there is a bit of friction, there are particles in space, space isn't empty, and that warms up the thermosphere. Humans spend their time in the troposphere. Most people live in the bottom one kilometre of the Earth's atmosphere, one, bottom one kilometre of the troposphere. And there, any chemicals that we're putting into the air, maybe chemicals that are from anthropogenic origins, you know, man-made chemicals, are... Uh, <clears throat> this slide represents the bottom 10 kilometers of the Earth's atmosphere, the troposphere, where humans live. Most humans live in the bottom one kilometer of the troposphere. Any chemicals that are in the atmosphere will eventually end up in our lungs. So let's just consider some of those chemicals. Human activity, anthropogenic activity, factories, etc., produce a lot of gases. The cartoon there shows the factories producing nitrogen oxide gases and VOCs. We'll see what VOCs are in a moment. And I could have put on a whole bunch of other gases, including sulfur dioxide. But non-human activity, biogenic processes, other plants and animals also produce gases, including VOCs. VOCs are volatile organic compounds. They're compounds of molecules that contain carbon, hence the organic. They are volatile because they easily turn to a vapor. If they're in a vapor form, we can breathe them in. It's worth noting that the biogenic origin VOCs are roughly nine times that produced by humans. Let's just spend a moment considering what happens to these volatile organic compounds, these VOCs. Plants, which of course includes trees, emit a vast range of organic molecules into the atmosphere. For those that have studied some higher level chemistry, these include functional groups such as the alkenes, alcohols, the various carbonyls, the aldehydes and the carbonyls, as well as carboxylic acids, plus others. Vehicles also produce many hydrocarbons, including some of the aromatic species, those that are based on the molecule benzene. Most of those molecules are insoluble. In other words, they don't dissolve in water, so they can't be rained out of the atmosphere. So how are they removed? Why isn't the atmosphere just building up over the many hundreds of millions of years? Why aren't the chemicals still in the atmosphere building? How are they removed? 
One way of removing organic molecules is by burning or combustion, which of course is an oxidizing process. The atmosphere does oxidize volatile organic compounds into much smaller species such as carbon dioxide and water or molecules which are small enough to be soluble in rain. And it does this using free radical chemistry. A free radical is a highly reacted species, a highly reacted particle that has at least one unpaired electron. Some of them have more than one unpaired electron. In the troposphere, volatile organic compounds, VOCs, are broken down in a complex series of chemical reactions using the hydroxy free radical. Now let's just be clear, the hydroxy free radical is an oxygen single covalent bond to a hydrogen and that particle together has an unpaired electron. It's not the same thing as a hydroxide ion, OH-, which doesn't have an unpaired electron. Down in the troposphere, there are some sources of ozone. Ozone inhabits the troposphere as well as the stratosphere. However, down in the troposphere, the ozone particle breaks up when a photon of energy from sunlight with a wavelength roughly of 330 nanometers interacts with it. It breaks apart forming an oxygen free radical which has two unpaired electrons and a normal diatomic O2. O2 we need to stay alive. O3 by the way is toxic. The oxygen free radical can then collide with water vapor, the H2O molecule, and between them produce two hydroxy free radicals. In chemistry terms, the hydroxy free radical is considered the detergent of the atmosphere. It's very reactive. In the third equation on this slide, you see the hydroxy free radicals bumping into a representation of a VOC, the RH in the equation. That stands for a whole raft of various organic compounds. And the hydroxy free radical effectively breaks apart the volatile organic compound one atom at a time. The resulting particles will end up being carbon dioxide and water or molecules which are small enough to be water soluble. The third equation on that slide represents a whole cascade of chemical reactions, many of which are still being studied around the world in various chemistry departments. Okay, let's leave VOCs and concentrate on nitrogen dioxide and other nitrogen oxide gases. What you can see on the slide here is a snapshot of data produced by the Atmospheric Chemistry Research Group here at Bristol. It just happens to be a data slide taken from the 21st of January 2001. Such measurements are being made daily. The graph on the x-axis here is time. So we have midnight at the origin, midday, midnight. The y-axis is a concentration in parts per billion of the NO gas. There is a relationship between NO and NO2. And what we can see is that the data isn't simple. There are two main features I want to draw your attention to. The big rise in NO concentration between about 7 o'clock and 10 o'clock in the morning and another rise between about 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock at night. This information is taken from a road just outside of this School of Chemistry at the University of Bristol and it represents some of the gases being produced by car exhausts. Nitrogen dioxide is involved in photochemical smog production. Photochemical because sunlight's energy is required as part of the process which has been just the start of the process as represented in this slide. just wanted to show that nitrogen dioxide itself will undergo reaction using the energy from the sun at a wavelength this time around 400 nanometers producing the oxygen free radical that we met earlier that can combine with a normal oxygen molecule forming ozone the end just represents a number of other particles that need to be present
Here we have an image of an American city. Um, it's not Photoshop. That brown coloration is due to nitrogen dioxide. And this can be seen occasionally in other cities around the world. And it would be a very bad air day for those people who have breathing problems, those who are very young, the very old, and those suffering from asthma. You can also measure carbon dioxide levels. The image on the screen in front of you is just outside of the School of Chemistry, where we used to house the Atmospheric Chemistry Research Group until recently. And we used to have a pipe coming out of that building on the left, taking in air samples from what is a very busy road during Bristol's rush hour. For those of you that know Bristol, if you carry on down the road about 200 metres, you get a Bristol Children's Hospital. This slide shows you a output of the carbon dioxide measurements taken on that road. Again, the x-axis is a time scale. Dates happen to be time. The y-axis is the levels of carbon dioxide measured in parts per million. And what we can see with the blue lines is that the levels of carbon dioxide on that road uh, change dramatically. You can actually link the carbon dioxide levels uh, on an individual spike with various rush hours during that day. The gap that you can see here is because our machines weren't working that day or the data got corrupted. Now it's very hard to see, but there is a pattern. If you use a computer to analyze the average of the carbon dioxide, you'll see this red line. Now that is not a straight line, that is a sinusoidal line. And there are higher levels of carbon dioxide at some parts and lower in others. What's not easy to see from the previous slide is that there is a seasonal change in concentration of carbon dioxide. The graph that we have on this slide is the most famous graph in atmospheric chemistry, otherwise known as the Keeling curve. These are levels of carbon dioxide made by Keeling, a scientist in America who in the 1950s approached the American government and suggested that they may wish to take levels of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere because it may be important. And when asked, where does you want to do this research, he immediately responded with Hawaii. Mauna Loa is in Hawaii. Now, the reasons for choosing Hawaii are quite interesting. Firstly, Keeling was a surfer, but that didn't influence his decision. Hawaii is a set of islands, volcanic islands in the uh, Pacific, in the northern Pacific, where there are no sedimentary rocks, so you can't make cement a process which releases carbon dioxide. There's no iron deposits and there's no smelting of iron which releases carbon dioxide and they don't make aluminium which reaches, uh, releases carbon dioxide. The air above Hawaii therefore represents the air in the northern hemisphere. If we look at the graph in detail, it's quite a difficult graph to read here, but what you should be able to see is the time scale and the levels of carbon dioxide as in the previous graph. And for each particular year, there is a sawtooth pattern. Levels of CO2 are higher in the winter and lower in the summer. Now, if you think about it, Hawaii doesn't require lots of central heating to be turned on in the winter. It's a nice warm place to be all year round. What it does represent is that the carbon dioxide levels in the winter are higher because there is less photosynthesis occurring in the northern hemisphere. Photosynthesis uses up carbon dioxide. If trees, the deciduous trees, have lost their leaves, there's less CO2 being removed in the winter than there is in the summer. Now, if all was well with planet Earth, that level would be parallel to the date axis. And as you can see here, the levels of carbon dioxide year on year are increasing. Before we go any further into the consequences of raising of carbon dioxide, let's take a moment or two to consider climate. 
climate is not the same thing as the weather. To understand how the Earth's climate works, let's consider the granny model. Grandmothers worldwide are intelligent people who know to stay warm, they have to sit at a particular distance from a heat source, from a fire. Too close to the fire, they get too hot. Too far away, they get too cold. In our analogy here, let's consider the heat source being the sun and the granny being planet Earth. The Earth is sufficiently far from the sun to have an average temperature of roughly 10 degrees centigrade. Those calculations are simply based on the energy being produced by the sun falling on the Earth's atmosphere at the distance that we are from our nearest star. But it's not that simple. There's a problem. Clouds and ice. If we consider a hundred units of energy coming in from the sun, clouds, the top side of clouds, scatter some of that energy back to space without it warming the planet. Roughly 24 units, 24%. Ice surfaces, snow surfaces on planet themselves, scatter energy back to space. That's roughly 6%. So we're losing 30% of the incoming solar radiation from the sun without it being able to be absorbed and warming the surface of the planet. For the geographers, this is known as the albedo effect. We're only getting 70% of the incoming solar radiation. In our analogy, it's though a small animal or a small child is getting between the granny and the heat source. And if we redo the calculations, looking at only 70% of the incoming radiation warming the Earth, the average temperature of planet Earth would be roughly minus 18 degrees centigrade. In other words, most of the planet, with the exception of a ring around the equator, would be too cold to have water in the liquid state. We'd have snowball Earth. Without liquid water, of course, ice, uh, without liquid water, life can't exist. What can Granny do to warm herself up? Well, there are three things. I know the slide only says two, but there are three things. One, you could kick the small child or animal out of the way. The Earth cannot get rid of its clouds and its ice, so that's a no-no. Secondly, Granny could move closer to the heat source. Now, while the Earth-Sun distance does vary over geological time scales, it can't be done in a short time scale. For those who are interested, the Earth goes from a circular to an elliptical orbit because due to gravitational influences from Jupiter. But that changes in the order of many hundreds of thousands of years. So that's a no-no. Granny could get a blanket to help keep her warm. And that's what the Earth does. Okay, here we have a diabolically complicated graph. You have to imagine yourself in outer space. Here we have a diabolically complex graph. You have to imagine yourself in space looking down on the surface of the atmosphere of planet Earth, wearing glasses that allow you to see individual wavelengths of the outcoming radiation. The x-axis here shows you the wavelength and the y-axis a measure of the outcoming energy. If the Earth's atmosphere was only made up of oxygen, nitrogen and argon, i.e. no so-called greenhouse gases, no carbon dioxide, etc., the energy profile coming out would probably follow one of the dotted lines here, for example, the one at 280 Kelvin. It would be smooth. And we can see from the graph that it isn't smooth. There are big bites being taken out here due to carbon dioxide. There are bites taken out due to tropospheric ozone. And if we'd labelled it here, we'd also have bites taken out from nitrous oxide, water vapour and methane. Those bites represent energy being retained in the atmosphere and warming planet Earth. 
So our analogy now is like this. The sun is still producing the heat energy. The earth, the granny, is still receiving some heat energy, but not all the heat energy because the dog is in the way, trapping 30% of that radiation. But granny has got some blankets on, keeping nice and warm. Now, when we do the calculation based on these premises, the average Earth's temperature is roughly 16 degrees centigrade. So, greenhouse gases are a good thing. Greenhouse gases allow life processes to occur on planet Earth. Water is in the liquid state at 16 degrees centigrade. However, what happens if granny puts on too many blankets? In other words, we increase the levels of greenhouse gases. Granny would get too warm and too uncomfortable. Now we've got to turn our attention to be able to measure how much and which greenhouse gases have been in the Earth's atmosphere in the past at a time where we weren't able to measure directly the levels of various components such as carbon dioxide. And this is where analysis of ice sections comes into play. So if we want to know what the levels of carbon dioxide, etc. were in the past, we need to send some bright young scientists armed with a very expensive drill to the various ice sheets across the Earth's surface and get them to drill down and extract ice core samples. Now ice is formed when snow compacts. When the snow compacts, air at the time gets trapped within the ice. So we can drill down, take an ice core sample and do some analysis of the air that's trapped within the ice. The image on the left hand side of the slide shows you some of these air bubbles trapped within the snow. The age of the ice can be determined by the ratio of oxygen 16 to oxygen 18 isotopes. It's a bit like carbon 14 dating, but for ice. The graph on the right hand side shows you some of the output of analysis of these air bubbles. This for carbon dioxide. The graph shows uh, a time scale from roughly the time the Vikings were invading the northeast coast of England up to the year 2000. And we call this the hockey stick version of, uh, of data because the levels of carbon dioxide remain relatively flat at around 280 parts per million. Remember earlier I said current levels were 408 parts per million until roughly the 1700s when the Industrial Revolution came into being. The Industrial Revolution, of course, required energy from steam initially where they burnt lots of wood and then coal and gas and oil to produce the energy. Um, and the levels of carbon dioxide produced by combustion rose significantly. By the year 2000, that level of CO2 was roughly 380 parts per million. Now we'd be up uh, beyond the graph to the top right hand side. Just inserted here an image taken by another colleague of mine who uh, found these. We can do similar measurements using mass spectrometry of other greenhouse gases such as methane and nitrous oxide. And in both cases, you can see a hockey stick model that the levels have remained fairly constant until the age of the Industrial Revolution where concentrations have increased. So we can see historically that levels of greenhouse gases have risen. But what about the temperature? Well, this graph shows you a rather interesting plot. There are 60 million data points within this graph. It shows the temperature profile taken in the early days from uh, ship's logs and the uh, weather records of local vicars and the red line represents the temperature of planet earth going back to around 1860 where thermometers were uh, becoming more readily available um, and around about 1920 
we've taken that as being the uh, the zero level the zero in terms of change in temperature and since 1920 going up to the year 2000 there's roughly a 0.7 degree temperature rise currently it's now greater than one degree temperature rise The impacts of increased temperature or global warming, climate change, are fairly well understood by most people. Where we, if we take the images at the bottom of this slide, here we have a picture of a glacier taken in 1941 and taken from the same point in 2004. Most of the Earth's glaciers are receding, they are melting because of the increase in temperature. The impacts of global warming also will look at um, extreme weather conditions, both being too much water and not enough in the right places. The change will change the habitats of things like the polar bear. An increase in um, misplaced species, such as the malarial mosquito on the left-hand side. For those living in the southwest of England, it's been calculated we could have the malarial mosquito living in the Somerset levels in the not too distant future if global warming increases at the pace it is the top left hand side is some coral now, coral of course are complex uh, colonies that do require sunlight for some of the organisms to live the depth of the water above the coral determines how much wavelength gets through of particular um, of, of the particular wavelengths if we start melting the ice on the planet, sea levels rise, cutting down the light getting to the coral so the corals die out. So we know about the information from the past, but how do we work out what's going to go on in the future? And this is where mathematical modeling comes in and the use of a supercomputer or two. Let's look at the graph on the left hand side. The red line here represents the data, the actual temperatures on in the past. The gray line represents the mathematical model that's been created to try and emulate the actual data. The left hand side is natural forcings. That means taking into account changes in solar activity, volcanic activity and the impacts that would have on the atmosphere and you can see that despite the best efforts of the mathematicians and atmospheric scientists the gray line only matches the actual temperature profile in some places so let's turn our attention to the right hand side human activity anthropogenic activity can we look at the changes produced by humans in terms of levels of greenhouse gases and its output? And here again, we have the same situation. The red line is the actual temperature profile. The gray is the mathematical model based on human activity. Again, in some places it matches, in other places it doesn't. So the natural thing to do is that we put the two together. The atmosphere isn't just increasing in temperature due to human activity or just due to natural changes, natural forcings, it's both combined. And when we do that, we get a very good agreement between what has happened in the past in terms of the real temperature and the mathematical model emulating that temperature. Now this is a mathematical work done by the Hadley Center, which is part of the Met Office down in Exeter, linking with the scientists in the atmospheric chemistry research group at Bristol. If the mathematical model is good enough to give us the data in the past as a check, how do we use it to make predictions in the future? Well, we need to make some assumptions. We need to assume the population increase of, human, of humans on the planet and how much energy they would be using if based on uh, traditional fossil fuel sources. And then we can make predictions as to what's happening to the temperature across the planet and also the rainfall, which of course is linked with temperature. 
and we get graphs such as this one. So this is a temperature profile of planet Earth looking at the last 30 years of this century. And if we look at the scale here at the bottom, with the exception of a few places in the southern oceans, which will get colder, the majority of the planet will get warmer, including the northern uh, hemispheres, the Arctic region, which could be a 10 degree rise. In other words, we just melt the water off both the North Pole and off the ice sheets in, uh, in Canada, etc. So that's temperature. We can also use the temperature to look at how rainfall changes. Now rainfall changes. Some places will get better, some places will get drier. Those of you who know about farming, we know to grow crops you need a certain amount of water and a certain temperature for the food to be produced. If we start changing the rainfall patterns and the temperature profile of the planet, food production becomes rather a tricky thing. With an increased population, of course, food production is important. If we don't have enough food, we'll have starvation. Okay, so let's consider the amount of carbon dioxide that will be produced. So here on the graph, we have a time scale on the x-axis and we have uh, the amount of carbon being produced by the billions of tons, the gigatons of carbon emitted per year. Between 1955 and 2005, we've actually got the data. By 2005, we were emitting roughly seven gigatons, seven billions of tons of carbon into the atmosphere per year. If we had a business as usual approach, again, allowing for an increasing population and the energy demand that each person would, would need, we would get a projected path that by the year 2055, we would be doubling the amount of carbon per year put into the atmosphere, taking up to 7 billion tons of carbon per year. The consequence um, levels of temperature that that represents by increasing the amount of greenhouse gases hasn't been seen here since the dinosaurs roamed the planet. What we want to try and get rid of is this big yellow triangle of additional carbon to try and get to a flat pattern where the levels of carbon do not by 2055 get beyond that of 7 billion tons per year and possibly even after that dropping it down to some of the pre-industrial revolution levels. Now there is no one way of getting rid of that amount of carbon. There is no one technique to do that. So quite a while ago some of the world's greatest engineers, scientists, economists got together and part of the deliberations was to consider that we divided up this additional 7 billion tons of carbon into seven wedges that each by 2055 would be producing a gigaton of carbon per year. Do we actually know how to get rid of a gigaton of carbon per year by 2055? Well, I'm delighted to say that we do have the technology to get rid of some of these wedges of carbon. In fact, there are 11 technologies that each have the political, social and economic willpower to enact and get rid of a gigaton of carbon per year by 2055. Improve fuel economies, if you make, make uh, the burning of current fuels more efficient. Reduce our reliance of cars make our buildings more thermally efficient. We can make more efficiencies in the way we produce our electricity in the various power plants. We can start removing um, fossil fuels from electricity and the use of uh, carbon fuels in other areas, the fossil fuel carbon fuels. We can substitute natural gas for coal, for example, which is more efficient in energy terms. We can take the carbon dioxide being produced and capture and store it. Nuclear power is a possibility. In recent years, most people would have noticed an increase in wind electricity, in wind turbines, photovoltaics, the solar panels, the solar cells uh, use is, is prolific within the UK, sadly not in the rest of the world. And we can go down to biofuels uh, production not 
the technology for biofuels is fairly complex. We're not here talking about substituting fields of wheat for uh, crops to produce into, into diesel. We are actually looking about fourth generation of biofuels. So we actually do know how to solve this problem. We just need the political, social and economic willpower to do so. Thanks for listening. If you need further information, it's available from these sources.